Hello everyone. My name is Stumpy. A good friend of mine, Diana Motch from Louisville, Kentucky, wrote a book about part of my life. Now, I'm going to tell you the story that she wrote. Mama, Mama, look at that bird. He has only one foot. I heard a little girl exclaim outside the ship's door. The owner of the marina just happened to be standing nearby, and he informed the little girl and her parents that my name was Stumpy. Little Elizabeth asked, Why don't you put Stumpy in a cage so he won't fly away? Mr. Bill explained, Oh no, Stumpy is a wild bird and he can come and go as he likes. He will keep coming back to this place as long as he wants. I guess I am an oddity in the bird world, but I see humans with unusual handicaps all the time on the St. Johns River. I've seen people skiing with only one leg, I've seen fishermen casting with only one arm, and I've seen kayakers paddling with no legs. It makes me feel that missing one foot isn't so bad. We're all just trying to live life to its fullest on this river. People at the Hantu Landing Resort and Marina have been calling me Stumpy for approximately 15 years now after my unfortunate accident. Since one of my legs looks like the stump of a tree with no branches, this seems to be an appropriate name. I've never heard of another bird with this nickname or even seen another one with this particular loss, so I feel very unique. Since I am a great egret, I have felt special since the day I was hatched. In the late 1800s, we great egrets were close to extinction due to being hunted for our long, lacy white feathers. Back then, hats with plumes were highly desired by women of fashion. Luckily, the sale of bird plumes was outlawed around 1900 and the Audubon Society has helped raise awareness of the threats to all birds since that time. About 16 years ago, my mother laid three bluish green eggs in a nest made of twigs and sticks in the top of a cypress tree on the St. Johns River near DeLand, Florida. After hatching, my sisters and I stayed with our parents for about six to seven weeks. During this time, they taught us where all the best places to fish were in the area. Under their supervision, I became quite a stalker. They were so proud of my ability to silently step through the marshy waters and stab a fish with a quick lunge of my bill. After honing our fishing skills, my sisters and I flew away to establish our own territories. I decided to live in the Dead River area, which is a tributary of the St. Johns River. Many sportsmen enjoy the area, but fishermen especially like to cast their lines there. In a way, the human fishermen and I are in competition for all the fish that swim in these tannic waters. I used to dread seeing one of those boats enter my territory, except for one eventful day. I was still a young bird when I decided to catch a fish from underneath a log that was partially submerged in the Dead River. A bluegill lured me over to that dreadful spot, 
by leaping out of the water and twisting in the sunlight to catch my attention. It was still early in the morning, and bluegill for breakfast sounded good to my empty stomach. In my haste, I failed to notice the monofilament fishing line that was snagged on a log left by an unsuccessful fisherman the day before. As I followed the bluegill with my eyes, my right leg became entangled in the floating fishing line. Happily, I stabbed the fish with my sharp beak, threw it up into the air, and caught it head first in my open jaws. However, this was to be my last good meal for a few days. I soon found I had another problem, larger than hunger. Because so much of the fishing line had been cut from the fishing rod, it was a twisted mass in the dark water. The harder I pulled to get loose from its grip, the tighter the knot became and the deeper it cut into my flesh. In a few hours time, my right foot felt numb and I was losing a lot of blood. I felt ashamed that I had become so helpless. My mother had tried her best to warn me of the dangers of alligators, but she had forgotten to tell me about the hidden dangers of fishing line. After struggling for several days, I heard the quiet hum of a trolling motor slowly coming down to my prison site. I was too weak to offer any resistance when kind Captain Neesmith Smith noticed my predicament. He and his fishing buddy floated over to me and threw a towel over my head to keep me calm. It didn't take long for the captain to assess the situation and take action. In a flash, he whipped out a fillet knife from his fishing tackle box. While his buddy held my wings close to my body, he amputated my limp foot. Then, Captain E. Smith wrapped another towel around my sore leg in an attempt to stop the bleeding. Finally, the three of us set off to find a suitable place for my recuperation. Dead River empties into the main channel of the St. Johns River at Barker 53, so the bank of Hontoon Landing was the chosen spot. A marina occupies this beautiful space, and their dockhands were overjoyed to become nursemaids for a sick egret. The captain gently lifted me out of his small craft and carefully placed me on the bank near the fish cleaning station. He tenderly fed me the remaining metals from his bait bucket, and as he left to take his buddy home, he said, See you tomorrow, Stumpy. Thus, I received my name. I grew stronger each day thanks to the solicitous care of the marina staff, dock workers, and customers. Because I looked so pitiful, I received the leftover shiners from fishermen returning with their catch of the day. The Pollard Bait Company truck driver would toss me a treat as he filled the tanks in the bait house twice a week, and the dock hands gave me the bait that was extra sluggish each morning. I even managed to snatch a curious lizard that came too close for a look at me. Of course, the captain came by to check on my progress every day, and to his amazement, I was able to stand and fly 
in less than three days. Now I could go anywhere again. It felt so good to be free. However, the one place where I most wanted to stay was the marina. Those people all loved me. In fact, I became their mascot. Whenever they called out my name, I would obediently fly by for a treat. In fact, I had become quite adept at catching the bait thrown up into the air while I was still aloft. Every Monday and Thursday afternoon, I still make sure that I stand outside the bait house for my expected fish from the bait truck driver. I know it sounds like I have become a beggar, but I am only doing what my new friends expect of me. In return, I pose patiently for pictures whenever visitors to the marina bring their cameras. They say that I am quite photogenic. Actually, I lead a double life. In the spring, whenever the time changes to Eastern Daylight Saving Time, I get the urge to fly to parts unknown. Then, when the clocks return to Eastern Standard Time in the fall, I return to Hontoon, just like the human snowbirds. During the winter months, I grow plumage that attracts a mate from the great egrets that live close to Hontoon. Although my friends at the marina wonder about my comings and goings, I prefer to keep them guessing about certain aspects of my life. I feel like I am so fortunate to have been saved from an unnecessary death. At first, it wasn't easy for me to adapt to my new footless right leg. In fact, I still have trouble perching on a wooden railing or a tree branch. Even while flying, my bad leg still hangs lower than it should because it has been forever weakened. But, despite my handicap, I never give up. I even discourage other birds from visiting Hontoon by charging at them, flapping my wings, and chasing them away. I don't ever want Hontoon to have another mascot. In fact, I hope to spend the rest of my life here. Although bully birds still try to take advantage of my handicap, I feel I have a special reason to survive. I have a message to spread to all humankind. Keep our rivers and oceans clean so that wildlife won't be injured. Please be careful with your litter, especially monofilament fishing line. Dispose of your fishing line and other trash in proper containers. Remember, the life you save may be that of Stumpy Jr. The last time anyone at Hontoon has seen Stumpy was in the fall of 2003. We don't know what Stumpy's age was when he was rescued. We do know he was a welcome guest at Hontoon for about 15 years. We believe Stumpy lived a long life for a great egret and know that he provided many years of enjoyment to Hontoon guests and staff. Thank you, Stumpy. The first time Diana Mach saw Stumpy in 1990, she fell in love with him immediately. This photo of Diana and Stumpy was taken in front of the ship's store on December the 28th 1996. Stumpy's tenacious spirit inspired her to write this story. Also, she has hooked the wool rug of Stumpy that hangs on the wall behind the customer service desk. Diana is a retired media specialist 
and lives in Louisville, Kentucky. If you would like to acquire a copy of Diana's book, call Hontoon Landing Resort and Marina or visit Stumpy's website. Diana will be pleased to autograph a personal copy for you.